I don't think so. Was it, was it 10? 10 for everyone. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, why don't we make a, a start then? Uh, okay. Welcome everyone to this public meeting uh, organized by the Sydney anti orcas Coalition. We're an alliance that came into being in the wake of last September's announcement uh, of a new security partnership between Australia, the UK uh, and the US, featuring of course a plan to purchase nuclear submarines, uh, but which we see as part of a wider escalation of militarism uh, in Australia and uh, a drift towards war. Uh, that drift of course is continuing. Uh, our meeting coincides with a gathering of uh, Quad foreign ministers here in Australia, which has again seen much talk of war preparations, scaremongering headlines, security agencies playing an increasingly political role. Uh, we see the very dangerous defence minister, Peter Dutton, possibly eyeing a tilt uh, at the prime ministership. Uh, Anti-Chinese racism uh, is continuing to fester. Uh, I could go on. So it's a pleasure to welcome you all, uh, but this is not a happy state of uh, affairs. Our coalition is united by the view that simply sitting back and waiting for good sense to prevail uh, is not enough at this point in time. We aim to tap into and mobilize the sentiment that exists in Australian society against warmongering and confrontation with China. Uh, and this meeting is a step in that uh, direction. My name is David Brophy. I'm a historian at the University of Sydney. I'm chairing the event today. Now I actually find myself currently in New York. Um, so as we uh, do in Australia, I want to acknowledge that uh, here too, I'm sitting on land stolen by colonial settlement uh, in this case from the, the Lenape people. Uh, our home base in Sydney, of course, was built by the dispossession of many peoples, uh, the Gadigal, the Wongal, the Bidjigal, uh, and others. Uh, in the chat, some of you might like to acknowledge and pay respects to the elders of uh, communities wherever you happen to be uh, located. Uh, as we discuss the risk of future wars, we want to particularly recognise the way that the militarism of today is tied up with Australia's origins in colonial land theft, and continues to do damage to Indigenous land and communities. Uh, that'll be one of the themes, I'm sure, of uh, our discussion. We're hearing today from a, a diverse range of viewpoints uh, on AUKUS and have guests from Australia, the Pacific uh, and the US. Let me immediately then turn to our first panellist, uh, who needs very little introduction. Professor Noam Chomsky uh, is legendary for his generosity towards causes and activists worldwide. Uh, and he's very kindly joining us for the first half hour uh, of this meeting. He'll speak for 10 minutes, then we'll have a 15 minute Q&A session before he attends to duties uh, elsewhere. Uh, it's truly an honor for us to host here today someone whose intellectual and political work has influenced millions, if not billions uh, of people, myself and I suspect most of you uh, among them from uh, linguistics, media studies, the ethics of intellectual life, and of course his relentless and incredibly necessary critiques of American foreign policy, be it in Asia, Latin America, uh, the Middle East or elsewhere. Uh, Noam Chomsky has been and remains a towering figure of progressive politics. Now we would be here all day if I were to cite uh, even the highlights of Professor Chomsky's past publications. I, I think I'd be better off simply pointing out the fact that he has, by my reckoning, uh, four new books forthcoming uh, in 2022, uh, reflecting his enormous range of intellectual uh, and political interests. Uh, Notes on Resistance with David Barsamian, The Secrets of Words with Andrea Morrow, New World in Our Hearts with Michael Albert, uh, and The Withdrawal with Vijay Prashad. Uh, please look out for all of them. Um, again, we in the Sydney anti orcas Coalition are immensely grateful to Professor Chomsky for sharing uh, today his thoughts uh, on AUKUS and the state of the world. Uh, I'd ask that the audience uh, please put any questions that you have for him into the, uh, the Q&A box. We'll try to get to as many as we can in the limited time that we have. Uh, and I will now pass the floor to him. Shall I? Shall I start? Please, please. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you. Well, as the Winter Olympics opened, uh, President, Presidents Putin and Xi met in Beijing to form a new axis, the New York Times reported. The principal announced by this reincarnation of Hitler and Mussolini, the report continued, I'll quote it, is that a powerful country should be able to impose its will 
within its declared sphere of influence. The country should even be able to topple, to topple a weaker nearby government without the world interfering. An idea that the US has always abhorred, we are to understand. Uh, China is the more dangerous of the new Axis forces on the march and the United States is preparing to defend itself from the awesome uh, Chinese threat. Washington's current approach to the threat of China is called encirclement, uh, containment to being out of date. Encirclement includes the formation of the Quad, supplementing AUKUS and the Anglosphere's Five Eyes, and far more extensive strategic military alliances confronting China that are now being implemented. China can counter with a troubled hinterland. The radical military imbalance in favor of the United States is being enhanced, as you know, by the latest AUKUS achievement, the plan to provide Australia with a fleet of nuclear submarines to extend already overwhelming US military dominance in the seas that are critical for Chinese commerce. Uh, current US national security strategy established by Trump carried over by Biden is designed to prevail in a war with China or Russia or both simultaneously. In order to achieve this objective, a military spending, which of course dwarfs all others, was greatly enhanced by Trump, now even more so by Biden and Congress added some extras beyond Biden's expansion of it. If there's a better definition of insanity, it would be enlightening to hear it. In fact, we did hear it a couple of weeks ago on December 27th, perhaps to celebrate Christmas, Biden signed the, it's called the National Defense Authorization Act. It's described by military analyst, Michael Clare, his words, it calls for an unbroken chain of US armed sentinel states stretching from Japan and South Korea in the Northern Pacific to Australia, the Philippines, Thailand and Singapore in the South, along with India, all meant to encircle China and Claire adds, ominously enough, Taiwan is included in the chain of armed sentinel states. Well, Claire's word, ominous, is well chosen. Uh, China, of course, regards Taiwan as part of China. So does the United States, formally at least. The official US one China policy recognizes Taiwan as part of China with a tacit agreement that no steps will be taken to forcefully change its status. President Trump and his Secretary of State Pompeo chipped away at that formula. It's now being driven to the brink. China has a choice, the choice of either succumbing or resisting and they're not going to succumb. The core of the US-China conflict is in fact just that. China refuses to be intimidated. It's not like Europe, which strongly objects to US policies, sanctions, so on, but adheres to them because it obeys. China doesn't. That's the conflict. The US-China conflict is real, 
but sharply asymmetrical. Its nature was captured eloquently, if inadvertently, by a headline in the New York Times a couple of days ago. Here's the headline, I'll quote it. As the United States pulls back from the Mideast, China leans in, expanding its ties to Middle Eastern states with vast infrastructure investments and cooperation on technology and security. That's the New York Times headline. And unintentionally, the headline captures quite accurately what's happening all over the world. The US is withdrawing military forces that have battered the Mideast region for decades in traditional imperial style. In sharp contrast, China is expanding its influence with what's called soft power, investment, loans, technology, development programs. Of course, not just in the Mideast. The most extensive Chinese project is the huge Belt and Road Initiative that's taking shape within the framework of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization incorporates all the Central Asian states, India, Pakistan, Russia, now Iran, it's reaching to Turkey, clearly with an eye on Central Europe, may well include Afghanistan if it can survive its current catastrophe. The Belt and Road Initiative has offshoots in the Middle East, even including Israel. There are accompanying programs in Africa, and now even Latin America, over strenuous US objections. A few weeks ago, China announced that it's taking over the manufacturing facilities in Sao Paulo, Brazil, that Ford recently abandoned and intends to initiate large scale electric vehicles production for Latin America and an area in which the United States is far ahead, in which China is far ahead, sorry. The United States has no way to counter these efforts. Bombs, missiles, special forces, special forces raids in rural communities just don't work. Actually, it's an old dilemma. 60 years ago in Vietnam, US counterinsurgency efforts were stymied by a problem that was despairingly recognized by US intelligence, by US province advisors. The problem was that the Vietnamese resistance, it's called the Viet Cong in the United States, were fighting a political war, a domain in which they were strong and the United States was weak. The United States was responding with a military war, the arena in which it is strong and the Viet Cong were weak. But that couldn't overcome the appeal of Viet Cong programs to the peasant population. That was the dilemma 60 years ago. The only way the Kennedy administration could react to the VC political war was by US Air Force bombing of rural areas, other program authorizing napalm, large scale crop and livestock destruction, other programs to drive peasants to virtual concentration camps where they could be protected in the terminology of the day, protected from the guerrillas who US intelligence knew perfectly well that they were supporting. Well, the consequences we know. Now that's not unlike the dilemma posed when China leans into the global South by quoting the Times again, by expanding its ties 
with vast infrastructure investments and cooperation on technology and security. That's one central element of the China threat that is eliciting such fears and anguish. The prevailing view in the United States for some years is that China is a rising superpower confronting the United States and may in fact has been widely predicted for many years, may be poised to surpass the United States and dominate world affairs. For what it's worth, I'm skeptical about this prediction unless the United States contributes to this end by persisting in its current course of self-destruction. There's a recent study by Harvard University's Belfer Center for International Affairs, which concludes further that the so-called Thucydides trap is likely to lead to a US-China war. That cannot happen. US-China war simply means game over. There are critical global issues on which the United States and China must cooperate. They will either work together or collapse together, bringing the world down with them. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Chomsky, for getting us off to a start uh, with those comments. I'll um, I'll put some questions to you, to you now that have come through in the Q&A box. A reminder to people that we're using that Q&A function uh, for, for questions. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to um, synthesize some of the, the thoughts and, and issues that are arising in the Q&A. Um, there's been a couple of people wanting to ask questions about the anti-war movement. Um, I might just read one of these questions out. Given the rightward shift of official liberal political parties worldwide, what role do you see protest playing in the anti-war movement uh, to build awareness and to place pressure on the, uh, the state to, to yield to demands? And then there's a couple of other people asking a slightly simpler question. Um, do you have any advice on how we go about building such a movement? Well, the question has been asked for centuries in one form or another always has the same answer, work harder. We don't have a lot of means, but the ones we have are effective. Education, organization, pressures, activities as appropriate to the situation. The, uh, there is a rightward shift, but uh, there's plenty of resistance to it. The rightward shift is a struggle to try to contain growing resistance. In Britain, for example, the Corbyn movement was a powerful movement to try to create a Labour Party, to recreate a Labour Party that would respond to the interests of its working class constituents and they would become a participant party. That caused furor in the British establishment across the board. They were terrified of that possibility. You look at the votes in 2017, turned out it was a very popular position. Well, they were able to beat it back with uh, outrageous lies and uh, uh, dredging up the easy way to attack anyone, anti-Semitism, mostly fabricated, and they were able to beat it back. Now the Labour Party is back to uh, Tony Blair style, uh, what was called Thatcher light, but the forces are still there. Same in the United States. The Bernie Sanders was bitterly attacked by the media, condemned, either ignored or attacked, despised by the democratic political establishment. Nevertheless, they virtually won the nomination, 
because of massive popular support, mostly young people, and right now has a very important position as head of the budget committee. In that position, he's putting forward very positive programs, which are being cut back, of course, by 100% Republican opposition, but also opposition to the democratic establishment, policies that might bring the United States in conformity with most of the world on social justice issues where the US, US lags, lags far behind. Well, those are the struggles that are underway. Uh, Main Street, the power systems do not abdicate without a struggle. We know that. And the weapons of popular organization, activism can make a difference. They do. Take the United States country I know best, but the same is true elsewhere. Uh, the United States, there's a regressive period in the United States. Nevertheless, it's a far more civilized country than it was, say, 60 years ago. At the time of the Kennedy escalation of the Vietnam War, you could find no opposition to that policy in the United States, overwhelmingly supported. I remember very well trying to organize a little bit of opposition. The only way you could do it is by meeting a couple of people in somebody's living room or maybe in a church with four people, most of whom wanted to kill you. That's when the war was escalated. Well, changed. Uh, you look back to the 1960s, the United States had anti-miscegenation laws that were so extreme that the Nazis refused to accept them. Uh, women were legally regarded as property, not persons still taking over old British common law, didn't change till the mid seventies. Well, lots of other things have changed, not by magic, but by use of the means that are available to us. We now start from a much higher plane, thanks to the work that was done by dedicated activists over many years. Same is true in Australia, same is true elsewhere. Uh, that's the way we can proceed. Thank you. And there are many questions coming through. It's 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 hard to um hard to choose what to to put to you. There is a question here that is often a topic of debate in Australia among anti-war activists. I wonder if you have any any thoughts on it. Um, I might just just read it out. How do you appraise Australia's posture vis-a-vis -vis AUKUS, US bases, the Quad, uh, and so on? Uh, is it the case that Australia is being dragged into this uh, by the US, or is Australia itself uh, an imperialist champion? Um, albeit a, uh, a, bit, a minor one. As I say, this is a question that often animates discussion here in Australia. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that, that kind of issue. Well, the question kind of begs a, begs a question. It assumes that US encirclement with Australian support is an effort to address China's human rights breaches. That's what's assumed. So we can start by asking, does that have any credibility? Well, there's an easy way to check. Take a look at US and Australian concern for human rights breaches, where they can directly affect the consequences because they are complicit in the human rights breaches. Uh, so take US military spending, it's a good index. Take a look at it. Uh, in a category by itself, way above anyone else, are two countries, Israel and Egypt. With regard to Israel's human rights breaches, it's sufficient now to turn to the recent uh, detailed studies by Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch on what they describe as the second apartheid state first one, South Africa, having disappeared. You look down the rest of the list, you find the same thing. There's extensive documentation showing that US military aid is closely correlated 
with human rights abuses of the most severe kind, torture, massacre, aggression, so on. That's, and you look at other indices, it's the same. With regard to Australia, you can fill it in for yourselves. Take a look at Australia's immigrant policy, for example. It's a sca hideous scandal. I don't have to tell you. Uh, one of the times I visited Australia a couple of years ago was at the invitation of the East Timor Refugee Association. I was giving talks in Australia, talking about Australia's direct contribution to probably the worst slaughter relative to population since the Second World War. You may recall that it was Prime Minister Gareth Evans, the only, only leading figure in the world who officially recognized uh, Indonesia's conquest of what he called the Indonesian province of East Timor. That's while Australia was cooperating with Indonesia to try to rob East Timor of its sole resource, the oil of the Timor Sea. Uh, you can continue without my help on this. Uh, the United States and Australia have no concern for human rights. Repeat, no concern. That's evident from how they treat human rights violations in the areas where they can immediately deal with them because they are complicit and they have the power to end them. US and Australia, of course, are much concerned with human rights violations somewhere else where they can't do anything about them. That's cheap and easy. Uh, Chinese human rights violations are severe. They're within the limited range of Chinese reach. We don't help them by encircling China. Uh, we don't help end them by circling China, increasing provocations and so on. And uh, nuclear submarines uh, in the South China Sea don't help people in of the Western provinces of China. Quite on the contrary, they build up powerful repressive forces, partly in reaction to the provocative actions and that of course leads to more repression within. That's a familiar dy dynamic. So yes, we should certainly protest human rights violations everywhere. And we should also follow a very elementary moral principle. So elementary that it's embarrassing to repeat it. You focus your efforts on where you can do most good. It's no use condemning the crimes of Genghis Khan. Can't do anything about it. Makes a lot of sense to condemn an act to end our own human rights violations, which are enormous and extreme. I think that's how we should deal with it. Thank you. I'm very glad that you've touched on that um, that specific issue because there has been some questions coming through on that that point as well. I might just, if I could, keep you for one more question. Um, there's, there's a few questions relating to the to our analysis of the the state of uh, American politics, in particular world politics. One um, participant's quite interested to hear your thoughts on who's really driving. Um, American foreign policy uh, today? Is it is it coming out of the White House and the advisors there, or is it more decentralized, driven by um, institutions like the Pentagon, the arms industry, uh, and, and so on? And then there's another possibly related question, is just how we situate this um, increasing bellicosity uh, in Western governments that we see to the, the con contemporaneous phenomena, the rise of uh, forms of far right politics, um, what people sometimes refer to as right wing populism, so on. Do, do you see a connection between this, this pressure for confrontation with China and those, those types of phenomena? Well, the driving force in US foreign policy is a very familiar and traditional one, pretty much the same as the driving force in British foreign policy, 
when they were ruling the waves. Uh, the goal is to ensure that the United States will be in command as far as possible. And that shows itself case by case, as it always has. Uh, so take the two main confrontations today, Ukraine, China. In both cases, there are possible, plausible, regional settlements. Take Ukraine. It's known on all sides what the plausible settlement is. Everyone knows that Ukraine is not going to join NATO, not in the imaginable future. The, um, the plausible, feasible outcome for Ukraine is Austrian style neutrality. Worked very well throughout the whole Cold War. Austria was able to establish whatever connections it wanted to the West, to the EU, anything it wanted, no constraints. Sole constraint is don't have US military forces and bases on your territory. Not having them is good for Austria, it's good for the world. Now that can be the case in Ukraine. Uh, with regard to the internal problems of Ukraine, there is a framework so-called Minsk II, set up by the Normandy powers, France, Germany, uh, Ukraine, Russia. But notice something's missing from the Normandy powers, the United States. A regional settlement will take uh, Europe out of the framework of US power. Now, this is a long battle. It's gone on since the Second World War in US foreign policy, a leading, you may recall the slogan about NATO, old slogan about NATO. Uh, the point of NATO is to keep Germany down, keep Russia out, and keep the United States in, which means in charge. That's called the Atlanticist vision. It's always been in conflict with another vision. Uh, Gorbachev's vision when the uh, Soviet Union was collapsing was what he called a European common home. That was a reincarnation of Charles de Gaulle's uh, call for Europe from the Atlantic to the Urals. Uh, Willy Brandt's Ostpolitik was a move in the same direction. Macron's negotiations today are bitterly attacked in the United States because they go in the same direction towards a European peaceful negotiated settlement, which has a major downside. US is out. That won't do. So therefore, the US has to try to block it, ensure that there's an Atlanticist solution that the United States runs. It's very similar in China. Take the confrontations in the South China Sea. They're real. Uh, China's violating international law with the islands in the sea. Uh, there's no freedom of navigation issue. That's a farce. But there are uh, conflicts and confrontations. They can and must be handled by regional groupings. That's where they belong easy to handle them regionally, but that has the same downside. The United States doesn't run it and that can't be accepted. So that's the core of the conflict. It's an old story, goes far back, way back in imperial history. The US isn't innovating anything. Uh, after the Second World War, the United States was so far in the lead that it could actually establish and run global order. Notice what happened with that. Uh, in the early years of the Cold War, the United Nations was very popular in the United States. Why? Because the other industrial powers had been devastated. Uh, the United States could give the orders. Uh, the UN was just a tool for US foreign policy. Did whatever the US said. Well, that was a 
passing phase, uh, the industrial powers recovered, were still decolonization came along with its call for self-determination. Bandung Conference, non-aligned conference, uh, the efforts in the UN to establish a, a international uh, economic order, a new economic order that would be geared to the needs of the former colonized countries instead of just robbing them, killing them. New information order, give the third world some voice in the international uh, information system. All of this was beaten back violently, including assassinations, overturning governments and so on. Can't have that. And there's an interesting outcome, which is discussed We're right on the front pages now. You go back to the Alaska summit meeting a couple months ago, the United States and China, very rancorous. It broke up over a basic issue. Uh, China insisted on what it calls the UN-based international order. US opposes that. US calls for what's called the rule-based international order. Footnote, the US sets the rules. So we'll have a US-based international order called rule-based. Well, in US scholarship, uh, commentary, and so on, uh, you're supposed to be in favor of the rule-based order and opposed to the UN-based order because the UN is out of control. The US is no, UN is no longer favored, no longer just does too many things the US doesn't want. Uh, it even has policies like the UN Charter, which the US flatly rejects. Core principle of the US UN Charter is you cannot use the threat or use of force, except under conditions that are irrelevant. Every US president violates that. The United States isn't gonna be bound by that. So we don't want a UN based order. Well, all of these things are in the background. That's much more important than arms contractors and other things. Yes, they have a role, but fundamentally it's just basic fundamental imperial policy. Professor Chomsky, we'd love to keep you for the evening, um, <clears throat> but I think unfortunately that's all we have time for in this section of, of our meeting. Our, our deepest gratitude again uh, to you for taking time to, uh, to be here. We will be keenly following your ongoing work and contributions uh, to our common cause. Um, we're going to move now to the, uh, the rest of our, our panel. Um, uh, As we do that, let me just encourage any of you who might not yet be uh, active in this campaign to con consider taking that step, um, either by getting involved with the Sydney Coalition or with other groups in the city uh, that you're in. Uh, we have a sign up sheet um, for you to do that, which I hope will be put into the chat. We also have links and emails for people in other cities and states, which we'll put into the chat uh, periodically. Uh, if you don't see anything there um, in your vicinity, then um, please consider setting something up. Uh, we'd be happy to, to talk to you uh, about that. Um, I'll have a couple more announcements of ways to get active as we uh, as we proceed, but we'll, we'll now be hearing from uh, Professor uh, Lisa Linda Nadividad uh, from the University of Guam. Uh, Professor Nadividad runs the Guam or Guahan Coalition for Peace and Justice. Uh, she is a founding member of the, the Women's Association, um, Ihagan, Famalao and Guahan is also a member of the International Peace Bureau, uh, Peace Bureau's Advisory Council. She is an indigenous Chamorro who has exposed human rights violations against her people uh, and her native Guahan, a, a military colony of the United States. She's spoken globally on topics of demilitarization, decolonization, and uh, the role of women uh, in creating safe and thriving communities. Uh, she has presented interventions on halting the, uh, the massive military buildup that is taking place on Guahan. Uh, at the UN, at the Political and Decolonization Committee, and at the Permanent Forum on uh, Indigenous Issues. Uh, so I'm very happy now to pass the uh, the microphone to uh, Professor Nadividad. 
Thank you, um, Professor Brophy. And thank you again to my friends in Australia for giving us this opportunity uh, from Guahan to be able to share our story and our plight in our struggle uh, with militarism. I'm just getting my PowerPoint up here. So just give me a moment, please. Okay, there, great. And great discussion with Professor Chomsky in terms of just keeping it real, right? Just bringing it down to the bones. Um, and uh, my most, I'm sorry, I'm a little uh, befuffled here, but uh, just the pure reminder that we need to keep on fighting, right? It's very easy to get caught up in the different things and feeling like our efforts are in vain, but in actuality, this is what's shifting the world and we can't give up on that. I'm gonna start my timer here. And so, um, I always start these things with showing where we're from. I'm from Guahan, tiny little island in the Pacific, in the Micronesian region. Um, and so as you can see from this slide here, my island is a very important critical strategic location for the United States' Department of Defense in terms of its militarist plans, um, which also links, of course, to our role in AUKUS. Um, we are a non-self-governing territory. Um, of the United States. And as Professor Chomsky remind of the period of decolonization, which was set off by the UN in 1960, we continue to be one of 17 remaining territories um, in the world who are still suffered the classic malady of colonization. The last people actually to decolonize was Timor-Liste or, or East Timor, which he also referenced um, in his visit to Australia. And so we have been on this list since its inception in 1960. And we, some would argue that we are the longest colonized peoples of the world um, with over 350 years of a colonial history that continues to go on. And so being a colony of the US essentially means we have US passport holders. However, we have no vote for the US president. We have a congressional delegate with no true vote, meaning whenever our vote is a tiebreaker, then our, void, our vote becomes void. Uh, we have limited federal funding as compared to states. Uh, a GAO report from Congress stated that there was we receive about one seventh of the funding dollars and we're excluded from a number of standard US social programs. Um, and so ultimately our political status really renders us zero political power. And so what has this colonial militarism meant for our island? It's meant lots of things. And in so many ways is a classic story of other entities uh, throughout the globe who are heavily militarized like our island of Guahan. Um, we suffer from radiation exposure and this is largely through the downwinds of the testing, the nuclear testing that occurred on the Marshall Islands as well um, environmental devastation, which you're gonna see complicit with the coexistence of military bases. Um, where there's contamination, there's poor health outcomes. And in the case of our indigenous peoples is the, the prohibition of our traditional practices that include things like our access to uh, traditional fishing grounds, as well as our medicines that um, only grow in the conditions that are uh, on certain military bases. There's land dispossession that is continues to, to be uh, hanging in the balance. Um, and ultimately the deferral of our right to self-determination uh, as defined in the very classic sense of decolonization. And so the Department of Defense on our island, and this actually is aerial view of the island, um, controls about one third and they continue with their ongoing military expansion plans um, connected to the pivot, connected to AUKUS, connected connected to uh, different agendas that have transformed over time um, where their presence just continues to grow and expand and, and colonize our island and people. And so I mentioned earlier about the nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands. And so you can see from this slide, our island is, if, is within direct downwind of the Marshalls. And so therein lied our, lies our exposure to radiation. Um, and clearly a study that was done on our island uh, reviewing a 25 year period of death certificates revealed that the highest uh, cancer cases we had on island are in the villages of Jigo and Santa Rita, which are the two villages where the military bases are primarily located. And this slide shows uh, in turquoise the number of you or the incidence of tremorals in 
certain types of very rare cancer, and then you see the US rate that is the green bar. So we are significantly overrepresented uh, in terms of illness and different um, cancers. And that of course is connected to the military waste and environmental contamination that surrounds our island. And part of the realities of being on a heavily militarized jurisdiction is that you have high enrichment rates, particularly in the different territories of the United States, as well as the Pacific insular areas. And so um, this scale here shows our island um, at 5.8 per 100,000 uh, deaths due to wars. In particular, this was Iraq and Afghanistan in comparison to the US average as well as the average of the different states. Um, and this is largely connected to the economic conscripts that are created in territories with very little um, opportunity for economic development as a result of restrictive federal territorial policies. And so shifting now a little bit more specifically to look at AUKUS, I just wanted to share the voices and amplify the voices of different heads of state across the Pacific who have spoken out on the impacts of AUKUS to our region. And so we have from the Solomon Islands, as well as from the president of Kiribati uh, concerns. And so from the Solomons, he states, we would like to keep our region nuclear free and put the region's nuclear legacy behind us. We do not support any form of militarization in our region that could threaten regional and international peace and stability. This perspective is echoed in Kiribati, as well as um, the prime minister from Aotearoa, as well as the prime minister from Fiji and the president of the Republic of the Marshall Islands. And so I wanna zone in on uh, Fiji's prime minister's statement, the commitment of the Pacific Island nation to the elimination of nuclear weapons is not based on an abstraction. It is based on real experience with the consequences of nuclear fallout, and it is at the root of our sense of urgency. Um, and similarly, president of the RMI, we tirelessly underscore that no people or nation shall ever have to bear a burden such as ours, and that no effort should be spared to move. I can't see over my subtitles, um, <laughs> but you get the idea, right, in terms of the nuclear presence. And so this position is echoed throughout the Pacific because we have taken the brunt of nuclear testing between the Marshall Islands, uh, Maui Nui or Tahiti, as well as in Marilinga in uh, Australia. And so um, in line with the US's Asia Pacific uh, pivot strategy, uh, from which, you know, is another part of the cluster in which AUKUS is situated. Um, there's a quote from Captain Robert Lee, who was stationed here on Guahan, who said, quote, we're seeing a real realignment of forces away from Cold War theaters to Pacific theaters, and Guam is ideal for us because it is a U.S. territory and therefore gives us maximum flexibility, which really is saying because we're a territory, we lack the political power to resist their plans. And so we as a community have outcried in many different ways ways. Um, we've engaged a number of lawsuits. We have pushed back in terms of the violation of the Department of Defense on our own programmatic agreement directly with them. Our governor herself has called for a pause on the military buildup that's been happening. Uh, one particular case was connected to and related to the Hudson Lagu tree, which was the sole tree of this endemic indigenous tree uh, that's at risk for extinction. And even that wasn't enough for them to slow down their, their military-based development plans on the island. Recently, within this past year, we've had an international case filing um, on behalf of our Sina Hope Cristobal, who's pictured here. Um, she petitioned the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, alleging systematic violation of the right to self-determination of our people by the U.S., particularly focusing on uh, the denial of our right to self-determination, as well as on the growing and increasing militarization of our island. And so Sina Hope Cristobal was actually just nominated a few weeks ago for the Nobel Peace Prize um, as put forth by the International Peace Bureau. And so one of our local organizations, Protehi Letecten, Save Retidian, has been very, very active on the ground and also in the past few weeks has filed a lawsuit as represented by Earth Justice um, with the Hawaii office on, that was filed in our local district court against the United States Air Force, the Secretary of the US, the US Department of Defense and the Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. And this case is predicated on the violation of federal law in failing to evaluate 
the um, cultural and environmental impacts from open burning and open detonation of hazardous waste munitions that is happening on the sites where um, the development of Camp Blas, which is the newest base that they're constructing. And so in order to support, uh, we just, I just wanted to share a link for our petition um, that is to oppose the degradation and militarization of native lands that we continue to have circulating. And so we continue to resist, right? As Professor Chomsky shared, we have at our disposal to be able to resist and we need to continue to do so because it is one of the few aces up our sleeves in that regard. Sidzu Usma'asi from the island of Guahan. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Nadevidat. Uh, that was a very informative presentation on both the consequences of militarization in Guahan and the struggle against it. Um, so often in Australia, the Pacific perspective uh, is marginalized and, and ignored. We really have to work to, to put it in front of people uh, in Australia. So, so thank you for being here today. We have uh, Steve Murphy up next. I think we need to get his camera on again. Um, while my panelists are taking care of that, I'll just, just say, please keep the questions coming in the Q&A box. And if you have questions you'd like to direct to specific panelists, um, then please indicate that as well. Um, if you want to um, ask um, Professor Nadividad a specific question or you have questions uh, you'd like uh, a range of panelists to, to respond to. We're just getting Steve Murphy up. Uh, we're also very happy to have him here today. He's been the National Secretary of the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union since September 2020. Uh, he started out as an apprentice fitter uh, in Newcastle uh, in 1996. Uh, he then became an organiser for the union in uh, 2003. He became the Assistant Secretary of the New South Wales branch in 2010, uh, then the State Secretary uh, in 2017, and as I say now, is the uh, serving as the National Secretary of uh, the, uh, the Union. So please take it away, Steve. Oh, thanks, David. Um, well, firstly, g'day everyone, and, and thanks for making time to join this discussion today. I'll, I'll start by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land on which we all stand today and pay my respects to elders, leaders and warriors, past and present. Before I introduce myself um, a little bit more, uh, I also want to acknowledge um, all of the impressive speakers that we've got along today and, of course, the organisers of today's webinar and just say that I'm, I'm really honoured to be able to be invited and, and to be able to participate. And I want to thank all of our friends and supporters who have come along today to find out how you can get active and how you can support um, what, what the AMW uh, and the other unions that are doing in this space. Um, I think I should also acknowledge uh, the, the News Corp journalists that you know represent our right-wing press that are lurking in the audience today, looking for an angle on a Saturday. And thanks for the attention. And I, I, I just hope that you're getting paid your penalty rates. So I'm Steve Murphy. I'm the National Secretary of the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union. For those who don't know uh, much about us, the AMW represents workers all across Australia. Uh, our members, they make, they create, they maintain everything from sweets through to submarines. Uh, our members trade their labour for wages, working class, and they're proud that their union makes sure that there's fairness and justice in that exchange. And like so many Australian unions, including our close comrades at the Maritime Union of Australia, the MUA, we, we have a long and proud history in leading and in supporting movements for justice, for peace and for I became the National Secretary, as David said, just over a year ago, but I've had 25 years of activism within my union. I joined as a rank and file apprentice member, and I was encouraged and taught working class politics by the tradespeople who were also teaching me my trade. I was elected as a workplace delegate. I became a regional elected organiser and the leader of the branch uh, in which I was a member of the New South Wales branch and now National Secretary. What I found is one of the most rewarding parts of my job has been the opportunity to sit with good people from different backgrounds with different networks and offer our experiences and perspectives on really complex issues. Um, and usually our discussions make complex issues a whole lot simpler than what we, taught, we are told and taught that they are. Now central to our powerful movement and successes is the capacity for us to come together, to talk, to listen and to learn. And I'm certain that we have different approaches and views to this matter today, but I'm confident that we'll find that we've got so much that we can work on together. As a union of blue and white collar workers who build and maintain most of Australia's defence infrastructure, and at the same time being in a union that's proud of its history and commitment 
to peace activism, we come to the table with so much to offer. Last year, our National Council, which is the union's peak decision making body, passed a motion condemning the recent decision of the Morrison government to renege on the deal that we had with France and abandon the plans to rebuild our domestic shipbuilding capacity. Rank and file leaders on our council determined that, that 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 announcement not only threatened our shipbuilding industry and our, and our standing as a trustworthy regional and international ally, but it also threatens our nuclear free, free status. Everyone will recall as soon as the announcement was made about nuclear submarines, there was a chorus of the usual actors calling for nuclear power uh, to be uh, now um, operating again in uh, the debate to be, to be rising again within Australia. Our council authorised the leaders of our union to not only speak out, but to work cooperatively with organisations and communities who share our concerns. And I'm hoping that through forums such as these, we can build strong relationships and alliances that shape an alternative vision for what our domestic and international future will look like. And that's one that's based on secure jobs with good pay, with safe workplaces, that respect and recognise workers for what they do, where we're a responsible and an honest global citizen. And of course, where we've got a sense of security about the future and the ability to live in peace. Now, there's lots of people who are better placed than me to give their opinion on the, uh, you know, the geopolitical issues and uh, the regional strategic position that this decision puts our, our nation in. But I will say this, the concept of having an alliance with countries who share our values those countries who are our friends and allies, that makes sense. That kind of cooperation in the interest of peace should always be supported. But we can't support a definition that's about beating the drums of war or standing idle in the face of these weak and posturing politicians who will never pay a cost for any of their words or actions. And we certainly can't be silent when we have our media actors fanning flames of racism, fear and of, and of intolerance. So I want to spend my time here today just talking about how these decisions affect workers from the perspective of my fellow ANW members. So I want to share the experience of workers whose livelihood have been impacted by uh, this reckless decision even before the AUKUS backflip was announced. The proposed French design submarine bill was to happen at the Australian Naval Infrastructure Precinct down in Osborne in South Australia. Now, people who don't know where South Australia is or where Osborne is, if, uh, who are international, think about the middle of Australia, but right down the bottom. Uh, Osborne's just a couple of suburbs over from a town called Elizabeth, which is the place where Australia's car manufacturing industry died its final death. It was an industry that was dared by this same government's treasurer at the time, Joe Hockey, to leave Australia. And those kind of juvenile point scoring meant that Holden abandoned all of their manufacturing in Australia and they took all of their supply chains with them, they disappeared. Now that area of, Australia, of South Australia had massive social upheaval since the loss of those good jobs and those tight knit workplaces. Um, the ANW is no stranger to those kind of devastating industrial closures, particularly as free trade agreements are being used to encourage to kind of gouge our regional communities of the jobs that we've traditionally been able to rely on. And even me as a young unionist, when I was growing up, I got to watch my mates and my family members have their lives turned upside down when BHP closed its doors in Newcastle back in 1999. And the experience of those workers resulted at least in something positive, and that is a piece of research that helps to inform the way that we respond to these, and it's the rule of thirds. When these big closures happen, the workers end up in one of three distinct groups. One third move to a job that has got similar types of pay and job security. One third of the workers move into work that is insecure, low paid and subservient work. And the final third, unfortunately, never work again. And this region was at risk of succumbing to what we refer to as a, a valley of death, due in part to the closure of our vehicle making industry at Holden, but also because work was slowly drying up in our shipbuilding industry, again, due to policies of this government to send those jobs and the work overseas. Now, our campaign was tough, uh, but it was successful. After years of neglect and a lack of support for the heavy engineering jobs that are, are possible, the French arrangement to build submarines in Australia promised these working class communities something that is so important, and that is hope. A new era of jobs, skills for generation of workers, and a sense of security about the future. These were the jobs and contracts that the workers in Osborne had campaigned for, and they won. The AUKUS announcement and the backflip 
on that French commitment means that those workers and our union is back at square one. And I know that there's a lot of detail that we've got to work through with these new, numerous, uh, new submarines, uh, and it's yet to be clarified or understood, but it's highly unlikely that any of them will be built or maintained in Australia or by Australian workers. Australia, Australia we, we currently have no experience in nuclear propulsion. We've got no capacity for the management of high level radioactive waste. And we know that any proposal for the disposal sites that will come under the cover of this arrangement will almost always target vulnerable, poor and working class uh, communities, particularly First Nation communities. Now, because of this, our rightful domestic attitude to nuclear and the hesitancy of the US to share their knowledge and data around this 50 year old technology, it's most likely that these vessels will be built in the US and maintained by US contractors. Now for my union, two things are true at once. We have a lasting history of taking a stand against both war and the dangers of nuclear. We also wanna have a thriving heavy engineering industry that provides workers with good secure jobs for life. We want our defense submarines built in Australia. We want to have a vibrant domestic shipbuilding industry, one with high skills, with secure jobs, with decent wages that those workers deserve. We also want these to be peacetime vessels for defence. We can't, though, support a nuclear arms race or its escalation on our doorstep. So while this short-lived promise of a decent, secure future looks like it's going to be squandered for the workers in South Australia through this AUKUS announcement, all working class people have a stake in these decisions. It's not controversial to say that war is always stratified. I, I looked through and you know a number of my favorite bands to, as, as a quote that would capture this, but I, I guess the best one was from Black Sabbath. He said, politicians hide themselves away. They only started the war. Why should they go out to and fight? They leave that up to the poor. Well, the reality is our conservative media are helping to beat the drums of war because it serves their patrons in parliament. Politicians who are posturing, but with no pith. They will never pay the price for their decisions and history shows that they will always profit from it. It's working class and the poor that will always pick up the check and always pay the price. And we are either told that these geopolitical situations are too complex for us to understand or that we should fear other working class people from a different background. Both of those assumptions are insulting. Our concern though is pretty simple. We've signed up to an AUKUS coalition that is being defined as an aggressive nuclear escalation with attack submarines that we're going to point at our closest neighbours and our closest trading partners. We've signed up to, we've been signed up to a partnership, which likely means that our naval defence independency and our self-sufficiency is also being traded away. We've also been signed up to a deal that was made in secret, it was done dishonestly, and it was done without consultation, and it's significantly damaged our reputation internationally. And we should be honest about what is for the social good, not in the interests of just private capital. We don't want and we don't need another war in our lifetime. But if we are to beat the drums of war, then it should be about something that is worth fighting for. A war on poverty, a war on inequality, a war on exploitation, on political corruption, on wage theft, or on secure work on access to free education, on access to free childcare, healthcare and aged care, on corporate greed and tax avoidance and obscene CEO salaries, on media bias and their interference in political outcomes, on governments and politicians that act as profit enhancers for private capital. That would make a difference to lives everywhere in our region. That's worth building an AUKUS alliance around. And we would find many new friends all around the world as a nation, if that's what we were preparing for. But here, now, us, we should be building our own alliances for peace, for justice, and for equity. One where we have a secure job with good pay, where we can come home every day from work, safe and free from injury and illness, where we're respected and recognized for our contribution and our value as human beings, where we have a safe place to call home and a sense of security about the future. Now, we've all got some work to do to build momentum and to show discipline as we move through this unstable period of history. But small meetings like this always grow 
I want to thank you for your time today. Uh, thank you for your participation and solidarity. Thank you so much, Steve. Solidarity to you too. It's really fantastic to see unions stepping up, uh, talking through these issues with their members, calling out the reckless war talk and the, the way that that always puts the interests of ordinary Australians last. I think today you provide a really strong example that we hope other unions uh, will, will follow. We'll turn now to, uh, to Natalie Worsley. Uh, Natalie is a long-time nuclear-free campaigner. She's uh, travelled across Australia and the world meeting with communities impacted by the nuclear chain. She spoke in 2005 as a youth representative at the UN Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty meeting. She lived in Central Australia for a decade, uh, organising with remote communities against uh, proposed uranium mines and nuclear waste dumps, uh, and has also been elected to the Australian Nuclear Free Alliance uh, National Committee. Uh, she now works as a stevedore at Port Botany. Uh, she's a delegate and health and safety rep in the, the Maritime Union uh, of Australia. Uh, which has also taken a, um, uh, a strong stance on this issue, and she continues to campaign for climate justice and a nuclear-free future. Thanks, Nat. Thank you so much, David, and to the Antiochus Coalition for organising today, and of course, all of the speakers for the really thoughtful contribution so far. Um, I live and work on Bidjigal land in New South Wales, not far from the site of the first invasion, and of course, sovereignty over this land was never ceded. Um, I'm here today presenting an environmental perspective on the AUKUS deal, but as with all campaigns looking at environmental issues, this cannot be separated from a human rights and social justice perspective, and I think the speakers have covered this really well so far. All facets of the nuclear industry disproportionately impact Indigenous and First Nations communities worldwide. I'll be looking at how the AUKUS deal relates to the current and historical impact of the nuclear industry in Australia. Um, and highlight the absolute criminality of this large scale expenditure on military nuclear technology, when there's clearly a dire need for immediate public funding of social programs and climate change mitigation strategies in Australia and the region. Steve covered the job situation very well. Funding being put into this provocative project should clearly be utilised for development of industries that build renewable infrastructure, offer long-term training and transition to sustainable climate jobs, and of course, dealing with pandemic recovery. There are really direct environmental risks from the submarine deal. Aside from the massive energy costs involved with production and transport and decommissioning, there is a risk of contamination from a submarine that is sunk, whether accidentally, intentionally, or due to an attack. Since the Second World War, there has been nine nuclear powered submarines that have sunk around the world, and this has released a significant amount of radiation into the sea. An accident raising a sub from the floor could jar the reactor and set off an uncontrollable chain reaction and explosion, irradiating sea life, or if already on the surface, the terrestrial environment. If sunken submarines with large amounts of spent fuel on board are left on the ocean floor, it's inevitable that they will leak spent fuel. Experts say that a reactor containment failure, which would release radioactive cesium-137 and strontium-90, is also likely, but it's hard to calculate the time frame on which this would occur. The ocean does dilute radioactive materials, but even a small amount can be concentrated up the food chain through bioaccumulation. This can have ecological, health and economic consequences. Communities or countries that rely on fishing could be financially devastated, even just from the possibility of contamination. 20 countries still have a ban on importation of Japanese seafood, uh, which was enacted after the Fukushima disaster in 2011. And we know that all stages of the nuclear chain create waste that is hazardous for many thousands of generations. Despite almost 80 years of a nuclear industry worldwide, there's still not a single nuclear waste dump for long-lived high-level waste anywhere in the world. Successive attempts to build a national inter intermediate level dump in Australia, and from time to time proposed international dumps in South Australia, have been thwarted by affected traditional owners and communities, and their many allies and civil society organisations, unions and the wider community. AUKUS is just the latest chapter in Australia's toxic nuclear relationship with the UK, which started with allowing Britain to test nuclear weapons in remote areas of South Australia and off the coast of WA in the 1950s and 60s. This has left a continuing legacy of dispossession, contamination and intergenerational health impacts for Aboriginal people living in the region. Military personnel who were at the scene were also directly exposed and many suffered severe health impacts. 
In exchange for allowing the nuclear bomb tests, Australia was gifted the original nuclear research reactor located at the Lucas Heights facility in Southern Sydney, not far from where I am right now. The bomb test sites are not the only legacy contamination in Australia. Closed uranium mines have never been properly rehabilitated. There were cursory efforts at Rum Jungle in the Northern Territory and Mary Kathleen in Queensland, but there's evidence of continued leaching of radioactive materials into the nearby waterways. The cleanup and rehabilitation of Ranger Uranium Mine, which is located in an excised area of the World Heritage Kakadu National Park, is steadily increasing in cost and complexity. The current figure released earlier this month by mining companies ERA and Rio Tinto has been revised up again and now sits at 2.2 billion Australian dollars. Uranium mines also an exceptionally thirsty industry. The Olympic Dam mine is licensed to draw over 32 million litres of water a day, a day from the Great Artesian Basin. And this is allowed at no cost at all to mining giant BHP Billiton. This precious water sustains outback life and is being squandered to enable the extraction of uranium, which is of course a deeply contaminating mineral. The nuclear industry has long called for establishment of a civil nuclear power industry in Australia and is open that acquiring military nuclear technology will benefit this goal. Prime Minister Scott Morrison was quick to claim that AUKUS is not about development of weapons or nuclear power, but leading members of his government and the Influential Minerals Council of Australia quickly undercut these claims. Even former Prime Minister Tony Abbott, who's now a UK trade advisor, said, quote, if nuclear power is okay at sea, pretty soon it will be okay on land too. The Mineral Council of Australia calls this an incredible opportunity that connects us to the growing nuclear power industry globally and its supply chains. In fact, the press release that MCA put out in response to this announcement opened with a statement that says, quote, reforming the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act is the first step in developing the skills and infrastructure to support the critical technology needed to acquire nuclear power submarines. The EPBC is actually a critical piece of legislation in assessing uranium mining applications. National environment groups have long called for it to be strengthened rather than watered down. Both the EPBC and the Australian Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety Act of federal laws with clear prohibition on domestic nuclear power. And they are the target of sustained hostility from pro-nuclear voices who are actively trying to remove these bans. In a Minerals Council forum in June, 2021, the chair of the Climate Change Authority, Grant, the prohibition has to be lifted. And there is a secret society of people out there trying to figure out what conversation to have with government to lift that prohibition. Any expansion of Australia's role in the global nuclear industry, such as commitments made under AUKUS, will increase the pressure on country and communities that have already long suffered from uranium mining. The submarines would be fueled by highly enriched uranium with enough on board that the reactor core would not require refueling for its entire lifespan of 30 years. This is the most suitable material for rapid and ready conversion to nuclear weapons and some submarine reactors may have material on board equivalent to 20 nuclear weapons. Having access to this material definitely simplifies the path for any future government to build weapons. And this is from a technical and a social policy perspective. The AUKUS deal is also a major challenge to the wider nuclear non-proliferation regime and raises huge concerns for an already fragile MPT. It exploits a gap in the treaty, which is silent on the use of nuclear material for military purposes. Australia would become the first non-nuclear weapons state to receive this highly sensitive technology, which sets a very poor precedent for other states who will be emboldened to also seek nuclear material, which is outside their commitments. It may be diplomatically unsustainable going forward for the US to only have this agreement with Australia when other states have been actively seeking it as well. Inevitably, there's an increased risk of materials being diverted to nuclear weapons production. The former International Atomic Energy Agency Head of Verification and Security Policy, Tariq Ralph, calls this a possible Pandora's box of proliferation that could pose a grave threat to regional and international security. And many neighbouring countries have already pointed out the insensitivity demonstrated by Australia signing this deal without any regional consultation. As Lisa covered really clearly, 
Nuclear weapons testing in the Pacific caused and continues to cause displacement, environmental contamination and intergenerational health consequences. In response to what has been termed nuclear colonialism, struggles against nuclear testing, dumping of nuclear waste and other threats to the ocean environment have become pivotal to the identity of many communities. With rising sea levels, low-lying areas are being inundated, but even as they face climate emergency and deal with the COVID pandemic, many island countries have reiterated their commitment to maintaining their nuclear free zones as a priority. AUKUS assumes unimpeded passage of submarines through regional waters, which given the lack of consultation is a flagrant disregard for countries in the designated Southeast Asia nuclear weapons free zone. State parties to another treaty, the 1986 Treaty of Rarotonga, can decide if nuclear powered subs enter their territorial waters or call at their ports. Overwhelmingly, they've spoken against the ban, the plan, um, and Lisa covered Aotearoa's quick response that will maintain the ban of having nuclear submarines in its internal waters. The funding for AUKUS is the largest Australian military purchase ever, but it is effectively a blank check with lots of the key detail pending a review that's going to be held in 2023. This includes what type of subs, their operational capacities, where they'll be built, as Steve mentioned, and also when they'll be delivered. While the people of the Pacific and people who care about social justice see climate change as a profound threat to human life and systems that sustain us, it's clear that our rulers see climate change through the prism of what it means for military domination. Climate change will have an increasingly destabilizing effect with mass migration due to sea level rise, frequent weather events and contestation over scarce resources. The most recent defence white paper explicitly discusses the need to bolster defence capacity in this context, rather than planning to decarbonise and support Pacific nations and countries to deal with the impact of climate. They're planning to mobilise defence capacity to control and contain. We must note also that the doomsday clock, which measures humanity's proximity to extinction, is currently set at 100 seconds to midnight. The Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists have said it remains the closest it has ever been to civilization ending apocalypse because the world remains stuck in an extremely dangerous moment due to the lack of effective action on the twin threats of climate change and nuclear weapons. The Federal Coalition has committed billions of dollars towards what Scott Morrison has termed his gas-fired recovery. Instead of this, we need to work hard to build the campaign for climate justice and urgently shift the priorities of these major investments. I encourage people to join the, the anti-AUKUS coalitions in their particular states and regions. And in Sydney and in other places, we really want people out on the streets joining the climate strike that's been held by the Students uh, for Climate Action Coalition on March 25th. And this is an international day of action and needs to be absolutely huge. We want the billions allocated to the nuclear submarine spent on social housing, health and education, and to create the long-term sustainable, skilled and unionised jobs that we need to save the planet. And just to finish, I'm going to quote ANFA, the Australian Nuclear Free Alliance, which is a 20 year strong network of traditional owners, environmentalists, unions and civil society groups. ANFA released a statement in response to the AUKUS deal in October 2021 that finished, quote, Instead of adding to the legacy of nuclear waste and the elevated risk of nuclear conflict, the government should clean up existing radioactive sites and take steps to build peace and justice. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nat. I think if there's been any silver lining to AUKUS, it's the way that it's brought uh, environmental and anti-nuclear campaigners into what was previously basically a debate about policy towards China. Um, at least indicating the potential there for an alliance that could invigorate both anti-war and, um, as you've discussed, anti-nuclear and, and climate campaigns in Australia. Finally, we'll turn uh, now to Nick Dean, who has uh, was trained as a sociologist. He had a career in the federal public service. Uh, he's been a peace activist since uh, before the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Uh, he's currently the convener of uh, the Marikul Peace Group. Uh, a member of the National Committee of IPAN, that's the Independent and Peaceful Australia Network, uh, and of course also an active member of our Sydney anti AUKUS uh, coalition. Uh, over to you, Nick. Thank you, David. Um, 
In acknowledgement of its traditional owners, I tell you that I'm speaking to you from the land of the Gadigal people, land from which the Gadigal were violently dispossessed. And also I'd like to thank you who have stayed online long enough to listen to me as the last speaker. And I hope I don't uh, go over ground that's been covered very well before me. Now I remember waking up on September the 16th last year to the news of the AUKUS agreement. My first thought that morning was, they wouldn't, would they? And that was immediately replaced by, they would, wouldn't they? This announcement made me angry because of what it entails and because of the way it has been presented. On both counts, the Australian people have been wronged and even betrayed. Like other decisions before this one, for example, the purchase of the Lockheed Martin F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, and the decision to allow US Marines to occupy a more or less permanent forward position in Australia, the AUKUS decision was made without public discussion, much less any debate in the parliament, the place where decisions of such enormity should be debated. It was simply dumped on us, fait accompli, probably because they would have known that had there been open debate and discussion, the many flaws in the proposal would have been all too apparent. So let me raise some of those flaws. Firstly, August is just the latest manifestation of a steady local and worldwide increase in defense expenditure at the expense of much needed social programs and in ignorance of the climate crisis. I'll give you a brief quote from an article about the climate crisis from Ian Dumnock, who writes, escalating defense budgets need to be redeployed around climate action. There is little point in developing increasingly sophisticated means of killing one another when the future of civilization itself is at stake. Secondly, and very importantly, consider the strategic implications of acquiring nuclear powered submarines. They're well suited for stealthy attacks in deep waters, that is waters distant from our coastline. By their nature, they're not defensive, but offensive weapons. There's scarcely any pretense about the fact that they are intended for use in aggressive actions, no doubt initiated by the USA and against China as the expected enemy. So the AUKUS agreement, if it reaches fruition, far from fostering friendship with China, brings us closer to war with that nation. The AUKUS agreement includes more visits to Australia from US warships and warplanes, more US Marines in the Northern Territory, where additional military assets are already being built. Put together, putting all these things together, AUKUS paves the road for Australia to join the USA in open conflict with China. And that road to war is the road our leaders are taking us down right now unless we can bring about a dramatic change of direction. As has been said elsewhere and by others, AUKUS and peace are incompatible. We can choose between the two, but we cannot have both. Thirdly, AUKUS is the very opposite of the nuclear non-proliferation that up until now Australia has claimed to espouse. We'll just be the first non-nuclear weapons nation to acquire nuclear-powered submarines and others, such as South Korea and Japan, will want to follow our example. AUKUS may well mark the start of a wave of nuclear proliferation. Australia can hardly argue that the International Atomic Energy Agency that powering a warship by means of weapons grade uranium is making a peaceful use of nuclear materials. Besides, as Natalie pointed out, a nuclear reactor in a warship is automatically a target for deliberate destruction with the constant release of radioactivity into the environment. Now, during the 1980s, the Australian people made it absolutely clear that nuclear power 
nuclear weaponry and the entire nuclear cycle were options we had decided against. We'd had enough with the British atomic tests of the 50s and 60s and their legacy and the French tests of the early 70s in the Pacific. Uranium mining and supply was and remains controversial. Again, as Nat has pointed out, the so-called disposal of nuclear waste is a highly contested matter to this day. And now this government is seeking to betray that earlier conviction. The people do not want a nuclear industry on this continent. Yet with AUKUS, a nuclear industry is what we must expect. And indeed, some support AUKUS in the hope that it will deliver this very industry. Now, with all these flaws, it's hard to understand why the August decision was made. It doesn't make sense. Until you consider the underlying AUKUS and on display in the communiques issued after every annual Australia-US ministerial or OSMIN meeting, is both government's constant emphasis on deepening, or in their words, enhancing the alliance between Australia and the USA. Official Australian government documents constantly the importance of interoperability and reinforce the idea that Australia's security is fundamentally dependent on the US alliance. Well, I wish it to be known that Australia's security does not depend on the USA and that our alliance, as it stands, is in fact a threat to rather than an improvement of our security. I'm not alone in this. Ex-Prime Minister, the late Malcolm Fraser, expressed this view in 2014 in his book, Dangerous Allies. And nowhere is the danger of the Alliance more clear than in this awful AUKUS agreement. So let me summarize. AUKUS has been foisted on the Australian people as a fait accompli without following appropriate democratic processes. It escalates the militarization of our region. It takes us several strides down the road that has war with China at its end. It makes China an enemy when Australia need have no enemies. It proliferates nuclear technology and raises the risk of nuclear materials being put to use for non-peaceful purposes against the wishes of the Australian people. It diverts resources away from needed social programs and a meaningful approach to the climate crisis. And the only credible reason one can see for its adoption is that it further enhances our dangerous alliance with the USA and the USA's junior partner, the UK. Under which, with Minister Dutton's overt encouragement, war with China is presented as something we should all prepare for. So I say again, AUKUS and peace are incompatible. And that is why we must make a stand and stop AUKUS. Every person who wants to live in a peaceful and peace-loving Australia, and I believe that to be the overwhelming majority, should stand up now for the cause of peace. Thank you very much, Nick, for summing things up in such a succinct and, and firm way. We're going to move now into uh, about 20 minutes of uh, Q&A. Um, but just before we do that, I, I want to advertise an important event that is uh, upcoming. Uh, this is the Palm Sunday rally on April 10th. There might even be a slide uh, to tell you about this. This will be happening in cities around Australia. Palm Sunday, of course, is always an important date, but this rally will have a particular focus on AUKUS and the military buildup against China. Uh, so if you're looking for an opportunity to take to the streets in opposition to those things, uh, then please do put this in your, uh, your diary. Um, the Sydney Anti-AUKUS Coalition is also encouraging people to write to their political representatives uh, on this issue. Uh, we'll put some information about how you can do that into, uh, into the, the chat. Um, all right, we've got some other slides there with some of those uh, details. Um, Please keep the questions coming in. I'll start to distribute them to the, uh, the speakers uh, 
now. I might begin, um, Dennis, if we could just go back to the, drop the slides for now. Um, there's a question which I take is primarily directed to uh, Lisa, but others may have uh, views on this as well. Question is, uh, how do we build a movement in Australia which forms political organisation with uh, pan-Pacific peoples, peoples across the Pacific, both in social solidarity, um, but they're also raising the question here of economic solidarity, uh, possibility, for example, of coordinated uh, industrial action. Um, do you have any thoughts on that that you'd like to share? And then if anyone else wants to jump on, um, they're, they're welcome to do that too. Sure. Um, I think in the past, and I say the past because it was before my own engagement in this work, um, the nuclear free and independent Pacific was a really great model in terms of how the Pacific engaged um, not just neighboring countries, but really to the extent by the time it it came to its tail end, um, countries all over the world. And I think if we can in some way, you know, Nick McClellan, um, who I'm sure most of you know, because uh, he's based in Melbourne, uh, was very instrumental in that piece in terms of pulling together NFIP. And I think if we can revisit that model, um, not that we're trying to recreate the past so much as really kind of visiting the part of it that worked in terms of the alliance, the allegiance, the, you know, the, the networking together. And what's beautiful about the NFIP movement is it really centered the Pacific. You know, we're a huge part of the global space, albeit mostly water, but um, we, you know, very, um, our contributions in terms of, especially in terms of militarism, and, and, you know, it's not even about contribution because we're not trying to contribute to that agenda, but it's really critical. And our needs are oftentimes um, neglected, unheard, because we are small in numbers, right? But the intersectionality, as Nat was talking about earlier, not just of militarism and the denuclear work that we are engaged in, but also climate change. You know, and the Pacific has been the sacrificial lamb in all of those different intersectional areas. So that collaboration is really critical to move forward at this point. Thank you. I, just for the sake of time, we don't need every speaker to respond to every question, but if, if someone does want to add anything, please, um, please jump in. Yeah, just, just quickly on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, not, not to repeat, but just to say that um, there's been a lot of work and, and solidarity and outreach and amplification of voices done through the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. Uh, I just wanted to point people to an excellent report called Troubled Waters that you can access through their website that actually covers a, a lot of different perspectives from the Pacific and otherwise looking at the AUKUS deal. And it's just an excellent resource and starting point. And that's where I've had the opportunity through ICANN's work to actually hear a lot of Pacific voices firsthand and and be exposed to that and, and really understand because I think the way with all nuclear campaigns you know having people's stories and perspectives put is is how we engage people so in terms of building movements I think the more we can amplify voices with personal stories and looking at the humanitarian impacts as well as of course the environmental and economic impacts then that's going to be a great way to build the movement. Great there's a couple of questions here for uh, Steve Murphy relating to this uh, the question of the debate surrounding green jobs. Uh, Ella, for example, asks, how important do you think it is for a workers' movement against AUKUS and nuclear power to centre a demand for green jobs, uh, secure job transition opportunities towards renewable energy sources? Uh, Miro is asking something similar. Um, wouldn't it be better for unions to campaign for wind turbine manufacturing plants and other renewable infrastructure in SA, um, staffed by AMWU members, uh, rather than submarine construction? Um, we get your response on those. Yeah, Please, Steve. I'm happy to yep. respond to that. Mm. You know, I could have done a much longer speech to talk about all mm. the things that we're doing as a union. Uh, and anyone that's been kind of uh, uh, looking at the space that that is uh, the debate um, that was happening um, around the climate culture wars would uh, kind of know that the AMWU led with a number of other unions, a coalition or an alliance um, of eleven unions and environmental groups. Uh, called the Hunter Jobs Alliance to try and push back on, on that um, polarization of the debate that it was a choice between jobs and the environment. Um, and, you know, that's uh, the Hunter Jobs Alliance is an, an island, of course, it's happening all around Australia where there are unions and environmental groups coming together, looking at the, the economic reality. And that is that 
our energy needs are in transition. Uh, they're not in transition because the government uh, is, is pushing them. They're in transition because of international uh, pressure, but most importantly, because of the movement of private capital to areas where they continue to make profit. As profit goes down in the coal mining sector, they are protecting their investment, but doing very little to protect or look after workers. And what we want to do, you know, the, 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 the phrase um, isn't accepted very widely in Australia because of the way that it was poisoned during the last election of a just transition. But what we are trying to build in Australia is support for workers to have justice as those energy needs change. And unless we're able to get a foothold in those new and emerging industries uh, uh, and for Australia to have the skills to be able to do it, we will lose the capacity or other countries will leapfrog us um, to, to specialise in those and we will miss out on the jobs of the future. Um, just like we saw with solar panels that were originally made in Australia, other countries were doing a lot of research. They pulled the government support for Australian industry and we know longer are making those solar panels in Australia, you get imported ones. And there's all different technology now that's being researched and developed and expanded and a whole lot of talk around where the investment's gonna go. But just recently, even though that we've got hundreds and hundreds of wind turbines going up all around the country, Snowy Hydro 2, which is a massive government project, has zero local content attached to it. And we've seen uh, all of the wind towers being exported uh, or, or the jobs for wind towers being exported overseas and those wind towers being imported. Adding insult to injury, the wind towers are pulled through the town where we actually manufacture Australian made wind towers and those workers have to watch those come in. Uh, so we haven't dropped the ball and we certainly uh, don't have blinkers on when it comes uh, to renewable energy jobs where right at the, at, at, the, at the front line when it comes to making sure that that is a consideration. But what we actually need is the will of government to not only play a role in that change to ensure that it isn't just about private profit, but what we need is that the policies and levers that government can pull to make sure that Australian workers get a fair go and a fair chop at being able to secure that work, the skills uh, and a leg up um, so that we can make sure that we're manufacturing this stuff into the future. Thank you, Steve. I might just put the question about uh, the Labor Party to, to the panel and in, anyone who, who'd like to respond to it. Someone's asking, do you think there's a hardening of Labor's positioning on China at the moment, uh, the media backlash against Paul, Paul Keating's comments, uh, ALP strongly distancing uh, itself from that? Now, I should say we have ALP members in the meeting today, um, but at the parliamentary level, um, has there, is there a hardening uh, taking place? Where, where do we feel that the Labor Party is at on this question uh, at this point in time? Would anyone like to offer their thoughts on that? Uh, I'll have a go. I, 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 was, I was amazed um, at the, the way the Labor Party immediately leapt on the AUKUS decision in support of it. Um, they're not a true opposition at all to my way of thinking. So I'm, I was very happy to hear what Keating had to say, um, but as, as the question implies, um, he's now sort of out on a limb where the party's concerned. But I think the party should listen to him. I think he, he, he was the person speaking sense, um, and I hope he does so in the future. Does anyone else want to jump in on that question? I'll probably just take a, a couple of points. Firstly is mm. we, we, we need to, um, it's, it's um, something I was taught very early on is that, you know, it, when you read an article, there's two things you could ask yourself. You should ask yourself, firstly is, what is the person who wrote this article trying to make me feel? And secondly, why are they trying to make me feel that way? And if you look at what's happening with the media in Australia, um, they are fanning this, in a way that creates uh, really a wedge um, for Australians to be able to almost like you've got to pick a side. You're either on the side of China or you're on the side of Australia. Uh, they're, they're doing the same trick that they did in the last election around climate change. You're either on the side of jobs or you're on the side of the environment. And the truth is that that is not where the conflict exists. We've got a government at the moment that is deeply unpopular, deeply incompetent, and it's very clear that they are desperate. You can 
almost smell it like sulfur in the air, how desperate they are and the kind of things that they're prepared to say in order to drive a wedge and, and claim that they are better economic managers or better on national security or, or whatever else. I think that, mm. to answer that question, that's best put to the Labor Party and what their position is on AUKUS. But as I, as I said in my speech, the, the concept of building alliances with other countries that, that share our values you know, should be supported. But the idea that we would define that as being an escalation of, or, of nuclear war in our, era, in, in our region is not something that we can, we can support or sit idly by. I've had a request for a report on the anti-quad protest that was, I think, down in Melbourne on Thursday. Unfortunately, we don't have the capability to uh, bring other speakers in to, to talk about that. But there was uh, a response to Blinken's uh, presence in Melbourne, I believe, a couple of days ago, if anyone wants to put any more information about that in the chat. But we congratulate uh, all, of, uh, all of those who, um, who got out at short notice uh, to, uh, to present to Blinken. Um, a, uh, our anti-war standpoint, and um, that is um, something that we hope to continue and build on um, in coming uh, months. There's there's a fairly general question, um, but you know I think it is really the the crux of the the discussion uh, today. Uh, there's a participant who asks, well, we know war and saber rattling is not the way forward. How can the left articulate a, a broadly convincing alternative? And I, I put the emphasis there on broadly convincing alternative to militarism and imperialism that secures peace and genuine security in our region. Now we've we've heard a lot of different ideas about um, various different fronts in this in this campaign. But there, are there any key focus points that you see that we need to be working on to to bring about that sort of uh, al alternative that you'd. Uh, you'd like to highlight for the uh, uh, for the audience today. And this is really open to anyone. Well, um, Nick. Yeah, um, I'd like to mention um, something that the uh, IPAN, the Independent and Peaceful Australia Network has been working on. They've um, conducted a, a people's inquiry, um, which is more or less complete now. Um, and they aim to uh, present or uh, table a report in Parliament um, probably after the election. But that's an honest attempt to, to try and bring together a lot of the thinking about what's going on in terms of Australia's foreign policy and uh, its military stance in the world. So I'd encourage people to, to seek that out as soon as it becomes publicly available. That's just one thing. Thanks, Nick. Lisa. So I just wanted to share that the International Network of Women Against Militarism have actually developed and um, have available online a redefinition of security focused on genuine security as, as the question described, and really focusing on, you know, how do we shift these needs, right, particularly in terms of social service programs, education, and the things that people truly need to feel safe and secure in our environments and our homes, which includes home, access to education, clean water, um, and those kinds of reframings of safety. And so, um, so you know, aligned with women's, uh, the international women's uh, uh, holiday that's coming up in the next couple of months, I and mean, we're really going to be doing a push to try to um, get that more visibly uh, seen as an alternative to the current construct of security and defense. Thank you, Nat. Well, I just wanted to, to say again, I just really encourage everyone to swing in behind the school strike for climate. So, I mean, the young people have done what we should have been doing and gotten out on the streets in massive numbers and brought together people from all over the world effectively to talk about their future and they're our future workers. The jobs that we talk about developing are the ones that they're going to be stepping into and shaping. And so I think it's just so important that we give them that support. We saw through the pandemic, you know, the, the demonization 
representation of working class suburbs, especially in Sydney with the different rules and regulations that were put on people in terms of leaving their houses and freedom to move around the city. And I think that that was really noted by young people, you know, their schooling was so disrupted. Um, we, we just need to get in and encourage them. They have clear demands and one of those is for public investment. And I think that's where we're going to really make a difference. All of the social programs we talked about require public investment. You know, the Maritime Union has members in the fossil fuel industry, but um, just with my MUA hat on for a minute, you know, can't be afraid of having those hard conversations with people about what their jobs are going to look like and, and for the young people as well. So, you know, broadly get behind that and all the mobilisations where people are free for free to move around their cities. And um, let's just think about moving forwards, what this is going to look like. Um, and of course, the regional support is so, so important for that. And we often have uh, locally uh, located, but Pacific Island dance groups come along to the rallies and speak. And, you know, it's very important that those links are being made. Great. I'll just ask if uh, Nick or Steve have any final thoughts uh, for the meeting. Otherwise, I'll start um, wrapping things up slowly. Nick, would you like to... Can I, I mention an event that's coming up in uh, in May? Um, there's an event, and I'm just going to look at it myself, uh, Indo-Pacific 2022, between the 10th and the 12th of May in uh, Darling Harbour, mm. Maritime and Naval Technology for the Indo-Asia Pacific. Um, I think that's uh, going to provide an opportunity for some expression of opposition. It's an arms dealers convention, essentially. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. David, there's a, a slide for the young labor. That, uh... Yeah, no, we'll get to that now. Yeah, so look, I, I will um, just start wrapping things up. We, we're talking about events. I've also had another request uh, from Robert Staines, me in Adelaide, uh, uh, to announce an upcoming action there on um, Ghana Yeta. It's taking place at 11 a.m. at the Adelaide Convention Center uh, this coming Tuesday. Uh, the former US ambassador will be speaking there on AUKUS business opportunities. Um, there is a uh, uh, the campaign group No Nuclear Subs SA on social media that you can uh, follow to find out more about that if you're in the vicinity of Adelaide next, uh, next Tuesday. Um, now, as is often the case as you're leaving political meetings, organisations uh, advertise their upcoming events. We've had a couple of organisations uh, who've asked to do that. Um, one of these is Young Labor Left, um, who I'm very glad to say has taken a position against AUKUS. I think we have a slide for that, Dennis. Um, they'll be holding an event later this month uh, with their um, comrades in UK Young Labor and the Young Democratic Socialists of uh, America. Um, we very much welcome that step. We strongly encourage more members uh, of the ALP to join them uh, in opposing the AUKUS uh, agenda. So please uh, look out for that. Uh, event. Um, and then the uh, Communist Party of Australia also has a, an event that they would like to advertise, uh, upcoming event on AUKUS. I believe there is uh, a slide for that uh, as, as well. If in the last few minutes, uh, people have been putting other events into the chat that you'd like to advertise, um, please feel free to do so. Again, naturally, we in the Sydney Anti-AUKUS Coalition welcome, uh, indeed, we strongly encourage uh, more organizations and individuals to get involved uh, with our work too. Uh, we're a diverse coalition from a range of political backgrounds. We uh, won't always agree on everything, we don't have to. Um, but we do share the view that our primary task as Australians is to combat our own government's policies and actions that are heightening tensions uh, globally. Um, these actions are not motivated by a commitment to freedom and democracy but by strategic and economic rivalries that ordinary people here and uh, across Australia have no interest in and indeed only stand to lose from. Uh, these policies are making us less safe. Uh, they're putting our civil liberties at risk. Uh, they're fostering racism and xenophobia towards Australians of Asian background. Uh, and it's not just Australia. Uh, the world really can't afford a decades long cold war with China, uh, one that might turn hot uh, at any time. Um, and given Australia's now leading role in promoting such a vision of the future, we have a particular responsibility to steer our country and our society off uh, this path. And in the here and now, that requires us to call uh, loudly and clearly for the scrapping uh, of AUKUS. Uh, if you share that perspective with us, then please do uh, get involved. 
uh, we'll put the links for you to do that in the chat uh, again. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to thank again our panelists for their very valuable contributions today. Thank you uh, all for uh, joining us uh, in this meeting. I hope you all have a lovely weekend uh, and we very much hope to see you uh, again at the next online event uh, or rally. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to all the panelists. Thanks so much. See you all. Thanks, Matt. See you. Thanks, David. Well done. Thank you. Okay. We'll see you all. Thank you, David. Yep. Thanks, Dennis. That right. went quite smoothly. Yeah. Yes. Know. Great but... handling of IT issues. <laughs> Just fine. <laughs> Gremlins okay. in the system. And, and Diane, thank you very much for your help. Oh, thank no, you. no no problem. I okay. wish I could have made it to the practice run. Might have been a bit more across it, but okay. I think it worked. <laughs> yeah, oh, thank you. Thank you all, and thank you okay. again, David. See you later. Bye. Bye. Enjoy the weekend. Bye.